Hi, I'm Daryl Urbanski, and welcome to the Best Business Podcast. My mission is to help create 200 new multi-millionaire business owners. How? You'll do better when you know better. In my interviews, you'll hear from self-made millionaires, seven-figure business owners, authors, and world-class experts sharing how they did it so you can too without experiencing the same obstacles they did. When your life and your business grow as a result of what you're about to discover, please call me and tell me about it. The number to leave a voicemail is one 888 844-GROW. That's 1-888-844-4769. Long distance charges may apply. Dial now to call me, connect, share your personal story of how my interviews have helped, or share your current challenges and frustrations so I can connect you with an appropriate course, coach, or help you if you connect. Now, if you like this interview, please share it with a friend you think will benefit. They'll appreciate it, and I will as well. You can also connect with me on social media. Look for Daryl Urbanski, D-A-R-Y-L, Urban Ski, U-R-B-A-N-S-K-I, and add me so we can be friends. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy what I've prepared for you right here, right now. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Daryl Urbanski, your host as always, and today we are joined by a world-renowned teacher of Qigong, meditation, and holistic healthcare practices, Lee Holden. Lee created Healthy Movement, Healthy Mind, and Beyond the Scale for Weight Watchers back in 2016 and 17. These programs were the best pilot programs a company has ever run. Lee has also worked as a consultant for companies like Google, Apple, 3Com, University of California, as well as a few major motion pictures with Happy Gilmore Productions. Right now, Lee is producing a documentary called Superhuman, a film exploring human potential. Lee was also an assistant producer and starred in the docu-series Quantum Key. You can look for it online. And Lee is an owner of a successful holistic healthcare center in Santa Cruz, California. As an acupuncturist and doctor of Chinese medicine, Lee has figured out how to translate Eastern medicine for our modern Western lives. So I've asked him to join us here today and help us all better reach our full potential. So Lee, thank you for joining us. How are you doing? Hey, great, Daryl. Thanks so much. Excited to be here with you guys. Yeah, I'm excited because I love the topic of human potential. I love, it's funny because I was just watching a friend sent me this Instagram video before a call about this guy, like this kid was doing like, you know, he's like, I want 20 squats and whatever and push the sled. And the kid, he's a little 14 year old kid. He's like, I can't. And he just, it's funny video. The older guy freaks out. He's like, I've been on this planet 52 years. You can't. And he just like blows up on the kid. And it was funny. But I love that, <laughs> that reaching for potential, right? Like I, that, that oh, yeah. striving to be at our best and squashing weakness. And so I'm excited for today's call. But how did you even get into Qigong and, you know, and superhuman potential? I mean, this, is this something your parents were big on as a kid growing up? I mean, how did you even get into right. Eastern philosophy? You know, I had a little bit different upbringing. My mom was an aerobics instructor and my dad was a judge. And, you know, I guess when you combine those two things, you get Qigong. <laughs> it's a weird thing. <laughs> you know, but really, my, my parents were into meditation, hypnosis, neuro-linguistic programming. They weren't into, let's say, energy work, but they were into the, say, powers of the mind. And the powers of the mind are tremendous. And as soon as I started doing these practices, I was doing, like, deep breathing exercises and visualization. I was 10 years old. And I did it all through, let's say, high school and college for my athletics and schooling and anything that I was interested in. But sort of the side effect of this was I started to feel something inside of myself. I started feeling this buzz, this electricity, this elation, this you know mysterious force that I had no linguistics or narrative to wrap around it. And still, until I started, until I stumbled on Chinese medicine and qigong. I was like, aha, that's what was happening to me. I started seeing meridian lines and energy pathways and a, a science behind the energetic arts that made sense to the experiences that I had. And the only other thing that I had experience was with were martial arts. I, I trained in martial arts from 8 till 17. And they did talk about chi. In fact, I saw you know a few people do some incredible things like break a stack of bricks and I was like, whoa, how did you do that? And the master looked at me and he said, chi. And then he said, chi is not for hurting people. It's for healing. And he kind of planted a seed in my head. And I remembered it when I was a collegiate soccer player. And I had the most horrendous injury of my life. I was uh, jumping in the air and somebody took my legs out and I landed on my tailbone. And it sidelined me for my soccer career that season. And... 
team doctors and cortisone and physical therapy didn't help. In fact, I was worse off a month later than I I was upon the original injury. And that's when I remember that martial artist saying, Chi was for healing. And so I went home and he did acupuncture on me and he showed me Qigong exercises specifically for low back injuries. And I was better in a week. I was, you know, 80 to 90 percent better. And I was, in fact, playing again in two weeks. And so this was a catalyst. You know, what I thought was the worst thing that ever happened to me in my whole life turned out to be one of those things that was a blessing in disguise because Mm -hmm. it changed my whole career, changed my whole outlook. Mm -hmm. It took me to Asia and China and studying with masters. And it's been my passion and my work to help Westerners get in touch with the ancient arts of energetic practices, whether it's Qigong, Tai Chi, Reiki, yoga, meditation, and how to work with their energy so that they have more tools and resources to tap into their potential. I love that. I love that. Now, can we talk a little bit about deep breathing? Why why deep breathing? That's something you mentioned early on. I mean, in all this, whether it's Tai Chi or Reiki or yoga, breathing is a really critical part of all that. Can you explain, like, why? Like, how does breath work? Why is it important? Why breathe yeah. deep? It's essential to everything, right? I mean, if you look at any, like, the bridge between all these different arts, whether it's meditation, yoga, qigong, you know, breath is key part of all these practices. So let me explain a why, and we can break down the why as an explanation energetically on just about anything, whether it's emotions, mind, sexuality, relationships, whatever it is, we can we can deconstruct it and look at the energy behind it and explain why from an energetic perspective. So breath is energy. So let's say chi means aliveness, the force that keeps you alive. Sometimes it's called energy, sometimes it's called life force, but truly what it is, is there's some mysterious force that keeps you alive that nobody knows why, how, when, where. It's whether we look at it from a scientific perspective or an Eastern perspective, how we're alive. Yeah, we exist. So it's a mysterious. So they gave this word chi to aliveness, which means this mysterious force that's behind everything else. For example, nobody knows how your heartbeat started. You know, it's like uh, I heard a doctor explain the heartbeat as a match that learned how to light itself. Mm -hmm. And then once it burns down, it regrows and lights itself again. That's how mysterious your heartbeat is. Mm. And I was like, yes, this is what she is. It's a, it's a force. Most energy or energy is transformed in from one state to another, but somehow in the human system, it regrows and regenerates in a mysterious way, whether it's the brain, the nervous system, the heartbeat, or any physiological function in your body, if you look deep enough into it, we run into the mysterious. So this mysterious energy was called chi. Chi basically means energy. How do you get energy? Well, most of us think of energy by the food we eat or the drinks that we drink. You know, we get energy from a cup of coffee. It stimulates our system and we get some energy from it. But there is over 360 different kinds of chi in Chinese medicine. It's kind of like the Eskimos have a thousand words for snow. You, there's so many nuances to the different kinds of chi. So food is one kind of chi. Relationships are another kind of chi we get energy from. Mm. And just like we can have toxic food that we eat that's not so uh, – it doesn't have healthy chi. And we can have toxic relationships. So breathing is your quickest source to chi because you can go 40 days without food and still have aliveness but only a few minutes without breath. So breath is going to be key component to the chi and the health of your body, your emotions, and your mind. Mm. Mm. I love that. I love that. I love that. I love that. And it articulates it so well because your breath is something that it's so fascinating because if you focus on your breathing, you can control it and pace it and do it however you want. But even when you don't pay attention, it happens for you. So it kind of comes to this whole like destiny, like, you know, free will versus, you know, predetermined fate, right? Like you can control it. You have free will over your breath, but whether you focus on it or not, it will still happen for you. And it has such a profound impact on ourselves, our lives, our state of mind. So are there different types of breath? Why? Like, so now we understand what, why breathe and what breathing is. Are there different gears to breath? And you know what I mean? Like what, what yeah, what does it do for us? Absolutely. 
So let's say again, different kinds of chi. So let's say basically there's the chi that you want to have in the morning and there's different kind of chi that you want to have in the evening. So in the morning we want to wake up with, in Qigong they call it a lightning flash of vitality. Most of us think of that as a cup of coffee. But your little Qigong workout that's going to take, you know, maybe five to ten minutes gives you that natural boost of energy within you. That's called yang, as in yin and yang, qi. This gives you this uprising energy where we can have a lot of energy to get things done. And in the evening, we want a different kind of energy. We want relaxing energy. We want to clear the stress of the day so that we can sleep really well. This is called yin qi. So we have yin and yang. Yin is relaxing energy and yang is doing energy. And both are really important and they go hand in hand. For example, if you sleep really well, you have more energy to get things done the next day. Mm -hmm. So breath is going to be key to giving you a balance of yin and yang energy so that you sleep really well at night and you have enough energy to get all the things you need to get done during the day. Now, breath, for example, is key to all physiological functions. In fact, Doctors now will say the breath is key to physiological health on all the different systems mm. because when you breathe slow and deep, it helps to balance your nervous system. It massages your internal organs, which is good for your digestive system, and it takes pressure off your heart, which is good for your cardiovascular system. But what I find really fascinating is your breath is key to emotional health and mental health. Mm. And this is sort of intuitive. When you know, you're know you angry or frustrated, people often say, hey, man, take a deep breath. Or if you're here in California, they say, dude, take a deep breath, which is actually important because your breath is a reflection of your emotional energy. So, for example, if somebody is angry, they're going to exhale strongly because inhaling would mean that they would have to take in somebody else's energy or perspective. When you take a deep breath, it's the antidote to anger. But often when we're angry, we don't want to take a deep breath because we're pretty steadfast in our point of view and our perspective. Now, sadness is the opposite. Usually there's a resistance to exhaling when you're sad because you don't want to let go of something that you're attached to. And that letting go would be maybe a relationship. Somebody passes away. A circumstance changes. We get sad because we don't want things to change and they are changing. So we'll want to inhale to hold on and we'll have a resistance to exhaling. So the solution when you're sad, focus on exhaling and exhaling all the way out. If we're stressed, frustrated, or angry, take deeper inhales and that seems that starts to balance your emotional energy. And there's all kinds of techniques that will have specific breathing practices for all kinds of conditions that you might be going through. That's fantastic. So now That's what would you recommend to someone who's just starting with breath work and is interested in pursuing that deeper? Yeah, uh, let's. I mean, we're all breathing, right? And I think you said something really profound: is that breath is something that we can do consciously, but it also happens subconsciously. Meaning, you don't have to think about breathing all the time. You could be driving your car, you could be doing everything else, and your body will continue to breathe for you. It's one of those things. It's one of two things that you can do consciously. For example, I can't tell you right now: slow down your heart rate and then speed it back up like mm -hmm. we can with our breath. We could breathe slow and fast. The only other thing that you can do consciously that's usually be, that's usually subconscious is blinking. So you could blink your eyes and I could say slow your breath down and you could do that. So we say breathing is the bridge between your mind and your body. So when you slow your breath down, you are communicating an intention to your subconscious bodily processes. So Slow deep breathing reminds your body and communicates to your body that everything is okay and to ignite the inner healing power that your body's capable of. So can I take people through a Qigong breathing exercise that is good for healing and health and vitality? Yes, let's do it, please. Yeah, let's do it. It's called wave breathing and it's really good for your nervous system. So that means it's going to be helpful for clearing stress and replenishing. So take one hand, if you're not driving, one hand on your belly, one hand on your chest. If you are driving, you can still do this. You just don't put your hands there. One hand on the belly, one hand on the chest. Now when you inhale, see if you can first feel your breath in your belly. And then let the breath rise up through your ribs and then all the way to your chest. So it's a full inhale. And then on the exhale, you go chest, ribs, belly, all the way out. 
So you inhale belly, ribs, chest, and you exhale chest, ribs, belly. And it's a full slow breath in and a full exhale out. And this happens in through the nose, out through the nose. In about 30 seconds to a minute, you shift the nervous system, you bring healing energy to all the internal organs. And as one of my students who's a Western MD said, if you could put the benefits of deep breathing into a pharmaceutical pill, it would be the best selling drug because there's so many wonderful benefits to that practice. So that's wave breathing, belly, ribs, chest, exhale all the way out, do that for one minute, and you do that periodically through the day, and it helps to clear stress and recharge the whole system. I love that. Now, I've never done chest down, belly down first on the exhale. I like that was neat because I was doing it as you were talking, and I I was assuming things. I thought I knew where you, knew where you were going, so I started to go belly first. And then, But then when you said the opposite, I was like, oh, and I, I never considered that. Now, why the mm-hmm. nose breathing? Why breathe through your nose? Why not your mouth? It's kind of like this. Mouth is for eating. Nose is for breathing. It's a good way to think about it. For, let's say, most of the time, if you can inhale, exhale through the nose, there's a lot of good reasons to do it. It slows down your breathing, and it helps you to not overly consume oxygen. And there's lots of research that's slowing your breath. It simulates high altitude, so your body becomes more oxygen efficient. And so this is really key to respiratory health, energetic health, and all kinds of things. There'll be key times where you would maybe reverse this or you do exhales out through the mouth. But for the most part, breathing in out through the nose regulates the nervous system and gets us out of fight or flight response and into relaxation response. And that can be so key to so many different things that we might be working on. I love it. And, you know, I'm glad you explained because I never knew the reason why. I just knew that when you look at other animals like rabbits breathe through the nose, your dog, horses, all these other mm-hmm. creatures breathe through the noses unless they're stressed, you know, like a dog's panting. That's right. Right. And exhaling out through the mouth is good to get rid of stress. But we want to do that skillfully and not all the time because otherwise we are sending a message to our body that we're under stress, meaning – What is really stress? People have a false interpretation of stress because stress means to your system that your life is being threatened somehow. So that's Mm. where it kicks into fight or flight. And your life is not threatened most of the times we're getting stressed out. So it's an overreaction. And in that overreaction, your body depletes its reservoirs of energy but doesn't get to actually utilize it. So if you're facing a grizzly bear or an attacker in a dark alley, You want that fight or flight to kick in, but when you're sitting in traffic, you have to give a speech in front of a few people, you're talking to your boss, you're thinking about the stock market. You don't want to go into fight or flight because you're not under a life-threatening situation. You want to be calm, clear, you want to be energized, you want to be centered to make the best decisions possible and actually to bring your best energy into a circumstance. And this, if you can do slow, deep breathing, will switch you back into this centered state this state of being clear in your mind so that you can take the best course of action. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now that we've established, because I think it, what's really key, and I don't want this to be lost to people. I want to make sure they understand, like we're talking about breath. And for all of us, we've been breathing all of our lives. So maybe we're beating up a, I don't want to say a dead horse, but we, you know, we're, we're talking about a, a moot point, but it's not because just like a car is an incredibly powerful vehicle, you can go vast distances, haul huge loads. If you can't control the car, it's of no use to you. It's like having a Lamborghini right. on a dead end street. Like it's, you've got this powerful engine, mm-hmm. you've got no room to use it. So by talking right. about our breath and how it influences, us in our bodies we're, we're learning how to use our full potential because there's opportunity all around us there's difficulty all around us there's always going to be both and your ability to capitalize on the opportunities available to you is directly proportionate to your ability like your your capability and that you're right, right if you're if you're stressed if you're if you've got tunnel vision if you're not you know taking care of yourself you're going to be limited you just like trying to run a race with boots on versus running shoes Right. So now what are some of the habits in filming Superhuman and in your work with top performers? What are some of the habits and rituals and routines that you feel like you mentioned that lightning flash of vitality in the morning? Is that a ritual thing you see all top performers sharing? Can you kind of map out like a typical day? 
Yeah, I love that question. And, you know, I love the analogy of driving the car, too, because, you you know, when we talk about chi, you need fuel in the tank. So this is pure energy. So you want energy in the tank and you even want reserves. You want your battery charge. You want fuel in the tank. You want all your energy capable. But if you don't have a good GPS, you kind of drive around in circles and waste all that energy and then you haven't gone anywhere. So good, clear map, which is intention getting our mind clear on where do we want to go and keeping our tank filled up. And often when we're stressed, it's like putting your seven-year-old behind the wheel of a Lamborghini. They don't know how all the buttons work or how to drive this thing. We have so much potential. We just don't have a user manual or the experience and resources to understand everything that we're capable of. And these superhumans are really people that have figured out over time all the different facets of our consciousness, the powers of our mind, the powers of intention, and the powers of our energetic capabilities within ourselves. So some great rituals, I think, that all people share, and more people than you would imagine, is how to turn stressful energy back into vitality. How to use stress as a catalyst for power as opposed to getting overwhelmed. Now, you can see this, you know, watch any Olympic athlete. That's a lot of stress. You've been training for four years. You've got an event that's about 10 seconds, a minute, five minutes, and a billion people are watching you. And you've got to show up, and you've got the best people in the world that you're competing against. So you see what athletes do. They take deep breaths. They shake their bodies. They knock on themselves. They're doing actually Qigong. All of these things that peak performers are doing are ways in which to dissipate stress and recharge their body. Now, what do they do also, let's say, in practice? This, we're talking about game time. In practice, they train really hard. They have a goal, and they take small steps each and every day that help them to reach their goal and practice. So in Chinese, they say, the thousand-mile journey starts with the first step. And I also, you know, when I think about this, I take it one step further because Taking that first step in a wrong direction, sometimes we end up in life a thousand miles off from where we actually want to be. Mm -hmm. And this might be not following our passion, not following our hearts, doing a career that doesn't resonate with who we are as a person, or being in a relationship that doesn't serve us. All of a sudden, we've taken a lot of steps down a path that maybe isn't supporting who we want to be and our highest potential. So thinking about clear intention of what do I want to create? How do I want to use this gift of my life and life force energy to create the happiest, healthy me that I can be? Not, you know, it's not that we have to be Olympic athletes or top performers, but we need to bring our best energy into raising our kids, into our work, into doing all the things that we do. It, it, we have fun and we feel passionate when we're bringing our best energy into the activities that we're doing. And I think we just too often think that peak performance is for athletes and artists and poets and musicians when it's for all of us. And as soon as we get into, and this is a key word, flow state, we start to feel a deeper layer of our potential than we ever thought was possible. So accessing flow state is key to peak performance. And Qigong is a way to access flow state each and every day so that we can bring our best energy into all the activities that we do. Now, Qigong, I mean, this is something that uh, you see all the time. I'm, at the time of this recording, I'm in Vietnam. If we go to the park, we'll see people doing Qigong there. You see it all over Asia and in Asian communities and the rest of the world. Why don't we do that in the Western world? And why are they doing Is it? Is it a big dedication? Like, you know what I mean? Does it take a ton of time? Is it three hours out of your day every day? Like, why do we see right. people doing it everywhere in Asia and, you know, and, yeah. I'll, I'll and not so much here in the, in the Western right. world. Yeah, and this is a great point because more people do Qigong than any other form of exercise in the world. And it's one of the longest standing forms of ritualized exercise that's ever been, meaning that it has a history that goes wow. back four or 5,000 years and it's part of Chinese medicine. It's one of those things that through time, it's a well-trodden path to health, energy, and vitality. And when I discovered it, I was like, you know, why aren't more people doing this? Why aren't my friends playing soccer? Why aren't my friends who are now having stressful jobs in Silicon Valley doing these practices that don't take so much time and lead to really effective results? You know, so I think there's a perception that we need to really effort into our exercise and our fitness to get results 
when that's not true. And we'll, you know, Qigong is called the arts of preventing disease and prolonging life. And it's really about vitality and energy. And when we're talking about preventing disease, stress is key. In fact, Western research shows that about 90% of primary doctor visits are stress related. So a mental, emotional thing creating a physiological response having a huge impact on our healthcare. And so I think this practice is more applicable now than ever before because we have so much technology, so much energy is going on our external focus rather than on our internal life. I mean, in fact, we spend way more time on managing our money than we do our energy and our chi. We spend more time watching our computer screens than we do reflecting on our own consciousness. So we've become out of balance with a natural flow of life. And when we get rebalanced, we enjoy our lives much more and we're much happier and much healthier. And so I think, you know, the perception that it's for older Asian people that they do in the park is just a false perception. And it's the real inquiry is what does this practice have in store for me? How can it lead to benefits that I might need in my life? And who doesn't want less stress and more energy? And that's what this practice can do in a very short amount of time. I mean, you don't even have to change clothes. You don't have to put yourself <laughs> in a pretzel like you do yoga. Right. You don't have to go to a gym. You just go, you know, 10, 15 minutes of doing Qigong practice. You've cleared stress and recharge and you're back to work with a better attitude. I love this. So you can do it in 10, 15 minutes. You can do it in everyday normal clothes and you don't need any sort of facility or space like you would yoga or anything like that. You can do it anywhere, anytime. So that means basically if you have 10, 15 minutes, which is longer than a cigarette break or sorry, shorter than a cigarette break, longer than a, well, depending on who, a bathroom break, kind of in between the two. I mean, you can recharge yourself and rebalance yourself and refocus yourself for the day. So Physically, apparently there's a very real physical connection to our mental state and our emotional well-being. Now, you mentioned Chinese medicine, and I want to talk about a couple of things like substances and foods. You mentioned like that that's a type of ener energy. And you also said, like you talked about Qigong, how it's so relevant and, and needed in today's Western world. Right? People are, I mean, diabetes is on the rise, obesity is on the rise, the chronic disease is, is, I mean, we're living longer, but we're living longer with chronic diseases instead of just avoiding mm -hmm. them. And so how do those like food and substances play into that? Right. I love this question because let's talk about the five branches of Chinese medicine. I'll give you a little bit of history because it's fascinating. Five branches of Chinese medicine are acupuncture, herbal medicine, massage therapy, nutrition, and Qigong. So those are the five branches of Chinese medicine. And the way the medicine worked, it was true health care. And what we don't have in modern society is health care. We have sick care. So we wait till people get sick and then we treat them and we sort of prolong this low vibration, painful existence, right? Because when we're sick and not healthy, we don't feel like we're just no. excited and passionate and inspired no, by yeah, life. We're just like, existence. Yeah. And through. yeah. And so Chinese medicine was preventative in nature. This me meant that the way it worked in a lot of communities in China was that you would pay your healthcare practitioner, let's say somebody like me who's an acupuncturist and Qigong teacher, you pay a monthly fee. And as long as you stay healthy, you continue to pay. And as soon as you get sick, have pain, have problems, your payments go away or they go way down. Until you feel better, then you start paying again. So the doctor is inspired to keep you healthy. If you're not healthy, in a sense, they're not doing their job. And so the whole paradigm is completely reversed because we have a billion industry in pharmaceuticals, hospitals, doctors. It's just it's multi-billions of dollars that we're talking about. Right. And nobody gets paid unless somebody's sick. So we keep people sick because that's how the paradigm, that's how the whole thing works. And it's amazing as, as emergency medicine. I mean, if you break your arm, get in a car crash, don't go see an acupuncturist or a Qigong doctor. Definitely go to the hospital, but to fight or to combat chronic disease, or to stay healthy, or to live a vibrant, energized life, these ancient techniques have a lot to offer. And let's face it, nobody likes going to doctor's offices or taking pharmaceuticals because there's so many side effects. And it's something that in Chinese medicine is called healing through pain. That means side effects and surgeries are painful when you can develop healing through pleasure 
massage therapy, doing exercises that are relaxing, eating healthy food, these create pleasurable ways in which we can heal our body. Let's face it, it's fun. It's way more fun to heal through pleasure and to be energized than have to work on a sickness that's debilitating. Right. Well, and there's more money in sick people than healthy ones. I, I love how the whole, yeah. the way the system was set up, exa exactly that, like the incentives fueled the results that we want, where, right, where it was in their best interest to keep everyone happy and healthy because that way they had, and, and I don't know, it's like, it's like they separated the two. In the Western world, they created insurance where you keep paying no matter what. <laughs> yep. You know, and then they have and this to... through this is in prevention. I mean, insurance in theory, it's kind of like we're looking for security. But what if something really bad happens? I'm going to pay for that, but we don't pay for prevention. Right. Prevention is the best insurance. You do, yes. you work on your health. Like health is not a destination. It's not somewhere you arrive. It's like, oh, I ate healthy yesterday, so I don't have to do it again today. It's an ongoing process that we continually manage. We do exercise. We do our breath work. We manage our stress, we enjoy our life, we eat healthy, we have good friends and nourishing relationships, and more likely than not, you are going to lead a healthy, vibrant life, and if you have high levels of stress, we're on pharmaceuticals, we're spending a lot of time in doctor's offices, we tend to stay in that system, and it is no fun, and it's a system where people are, you come in for problem A, and you come out with problems B and C. Yep. It is just a broken way of doing health care. Yeah. It's not a broken way of doing sick care, but we want to manage our sick care by preventing it from happening and then tending to the 5 or 10% of the time when we actually develop a problem and not the reverse. It's just our paradigm doesn't support well, happy, healthy people. Especially if you're in the States because in the States right now, they pay the most per capita for health care and they've got like only the world's like – 30th or 20th best healthcare in the world. So they're paying top dollar yeah. for it, but they're getting subpar. It's not a dollar in value out, right? Like it's just, no, it's, it's not. not. Yeah. Health is wealth. And you know, out of all the types yeah. of problems you can have in your life, money problems are usually the best ones because you can always make more money, but health is the worst because uh, if you have relationship problems and you've got health problems, like they just compound on each other. It's exponential, yeah. right? Like health is just the, the foundation of everything. It's, it's the most, it's the best investment. Yeah. Right? We often don't realize until we're not healthy and then we're like, Oh, I'd pay anything to be healthy again, especially on chronic debilitating diseases. I mean, you know, from traveling, you know, when you get a stomach bug or something like that and you're just like buckled over, it's like, there's no place that you could be externally. You might be on the most gorgeous beach in the world, but if you have, you know, some serious belly problems, you are not appreciating where you are. So health is key to happiness. Well, if people don't even get the race that they're in. Like, so, sorry for interrupting, but no. I think I like if let's say we were like, let's say let's take the analogy. Life is a hundred meter dash and you, uh, the winner gets some prize. We, you know, we're not really sure what the prize is, but we want, or the prize is all the stuff that you want. And so we've got uh, a rabbit and then we've got you and you're the tortoise, but it's only a hundred meter dash. And we know in the story that the, you know, the tortoise won, but in reality, the rabbit's going to kick his ass. So what if you could swap out the turtle for a cheetah? Would you want a better animal running your race? Yes. Okay. So what if I told you that if you got up every day and you ate right and you did the right things for your body to maintain your body, you could live life as an enhanced animal? Right. Like that's really what we're talking about. Like brain function, mm -hmm. like movement is life. Right. If you had a car and the car didn't go anywhere, it just sat in its driveway parked forever to, to perform the functions de it, it's dependent on. You don't need an axle. You don't need brakes. You don't need an exhaust system. You don't need an engine. You don't need headlights. Right. You don't need uh, power windows. You don't need a steering wheel. You don't need like you don't need all this stuff. You need doors and a roof you know what i mean and like a stereo like a that's it you don't need all the trunk space you don't need anything else and your body's the same way we have all these when they look at animals the animals that move the least have the smallest brains once you start moving you have to start like projecting like like anticipating the trajectory of where your foot's swinging and right and like you're maintaining balance and now you're in a new room and so there's new things on the wall and all that shuts down when you don't move and you don't engage your body and you don't activate the animal. So if you activate the animal, it's like going into a fight with eight limbs versus two. You just have more at your disposal, and that's health. Yeah, I love those metaphors. You know, you're right in alignment with Qigong, ancient Qigong sayings, and I'll, I'll give it to you. It's The saying goes, flowing water doesn't get stagnant, and the hinges of an active door don't get rusty. 
Mm. Now, the same is true with your body. Movement is key, and why is movement key? Because if you look around in nature, nothing is static. The earth is spinning at 600 miles an hour on its axis. The whole universe is moving. That's why they say sitting is the new smoking. If Mm. you sit, your chi gets stagnant. It's like stagnant water. You don't want to go up to a stagnant pool of water and take a big drink, but you want mo- water that's moved and is healthy. Yep. So key to health and vitality, not only for physical health, emotional health, mental health, and even feeling connected to a larger universal flow of energy is movement. Hmm. And how do we move? It could be anything. It could be walking. It could be you know exercise. But these ancient cultures – and especially the ancient practice of Qigong, has created movements that are so magical that they help to lead to that most refined energy that's sometimes hard to access, mm-hmm. that we just feel we feel good for no external reason. We just feel joyful from the inside out. Mm-hmm. And you know, going back to movement, I always talk about this, that people don't get old and start developing health problems. You get old and you stop moving. Older people don't do what kids do. And if you move as an older adult, your body all of a sudden starts regaining its youthful vitality. And uh, in tonight's class that I just taught, Daryl, I have three 90-year-olds in my class, 90 plus, and they are amazing. They're healthy. They're vibrant. I had some teachers that were 106 years old in China, and they were doing swimming dragon practices. And I was like, wow, these people moving better than a lot of 20-year-olds. So the key to practice, don't allow your chi to get stagnant, and it doesn't take much. It doesn't mean you have to go out and run a marathon. It's all about balance. If you're sitting at your desk once an hour, stand up, do five minutes of qigong practice, sit back down. It's little bits of movement throughout the day. Maybe do 15, 20 minutes in the morning, 15, 20 minutes in the evening, and that's kind of ideal for your body's health and vitality. I love that. I love that so much. So... Where do you see the future of this going? Like, how do you, where do you see in five, ten years? How do you, how is, are the, are the worlds going to yeah. blend? Is China's on the rise? Are we going to see more influence of this out, you know, like with mobile apps and technology? I mean, what, what can we expect in this field? In the next uh, five, no, I years? think it needs to be westernized. I think this ancient practice needs to make sense because we are in a culture that asks why. We want to know the reasons why we are doing something. Now, when I used to train in China, the students don't go, hey, why am I doing this movement? The teacher said to do it. You just do it. Uh, So we're in a different culture. We're in a different paradigm. So we need to have good reasons why we're doing something. And when we do it, we need to feel results. And so what I've done is help to demystify it. I've helped to put a linguistical structure on why we're doing the practice. What are the benefits? And how can we get quick results without having to go to, let's say, China or study martial arts? How do I make it practical for our athletes? How do I make it practice practical for children in schools? How do we make it practical for seniors and senior centers, things like that? And how do we make it practical for people that are really going like, I have high blood pressure, low back pain and digestive issues. What can I do? Mm-hmm. And so that's exactly what I've done is just deconstructed, demystified the practice and made it really relevant to where we are in our Western society. And I think that's going to be key to making this practice available and accessible. And I had shows on public television, so I have a lot of trial and error on how to make this work for people. And, you know, with the uh, results of PBS, because, you know, they said, hey, this Qigong, it sounds weird, is probably not going to work for a public television audience. And it was one of the longest standing movement shows. It's been airing since 2006. It had a wonderful response because people tried it. And I'm just really excited that for people to try it and see what kind of results they can get. And I think we're at, you know, kind of a tipping point where we were maybe 15, 20 years ago with yoga practice. I think we're going to see a rise of Qigong if we can make it accessible to people in the right way. Mm. So how do people get involved? I mean, you you put something together. Where do they go? Do they go to your website? Is, do you have an app? How do people follow or get in hold of your content? Oh, thank you. Holden Qigong is the best place to go. So that's my last name, Holden, H-O-L-D-E-N. And Qigong, that's the hardest part about this practice is how to spell it, how to say it. <laughs> Otherwise, it's really easy. Qigong is Q-I-G-O-N-G. 
And on the website, we have some really beginning products like Introduction to Qigong. I have a 30-day challenge, which is 30 days of practice, and it's only seven minutes a day just to get into the habit, see what the practice can do for you. And then I have a whole bunch of condition-specific, upper back and neck Qigong, headaches, any kind of condition that you might think of or might be challenged with. We have a specific routine that will address that. And then I have workshops and teacher trainings and things like that to meet everybody where they're at. I mean, if you get excited about the program and you want to teach Qigong and be on this kind of wave, this new wave of writing healthcare and mind-body fitness, that might be an exciting opportunity for you as well. So Holden Qigong is the best place to reach me. That's awesome. So everyone, that's H-O-L-D-E-N-Q-I-G-O-N-G.com. Highly recommend you check it out. I did my first experience with Qigong when I was 17. I'd hitchhiked to the West Coast of Canada. I was working and going to school, and I was just doing everything. I didn't have friends. I, you know, I had to meet people. I just started doing random community events. And I remember I did this Qigong class, and it was a bunch of all these older – well, I was 17. They were like 25 and older women, and it was just amazing. I remember after I did it when I would walk, and I, I remember when I moved after walking downtown – I felt like I was swimming as I walked. Like, I, ca I can't explain it. I moved with grace, and it had me go back, like, seven or ten times because there's so weird, like, it was, a, it was a unique and new relationship with my body that I'd never had before, and I really appreciated. And so that's part of why I think it's fantastic. Definitely go check out the website. Uh, Lee, thank you so much for joining us. I know with your daughters and your wife, you could have 101 other things you could be doing. So thank you for coming and sharing with us this, not just nurturing, but this life-enhancing gift. So I appreciate you. Hey, thanks so much, Daryl. It was a great interview, and I appreciate you being able to bring this wonderful healing technique out into the world to your audience. So um, wonderful to be here. You've reached the end of our interview. Now first, let me thank you for listening. I appreciate and respect you more than you'll ever know. And now I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. First, what three lessons did you just learn? What three aha moments just jumped out at you? Second, what can you implement for yourself and your business in the next 24 hours? Third, what can you give to someone else to help you with or give to them to just do it for you? Whatever it is, remember taking action is the secret sauce to results. Now, if you think this interview would be helpful for a friend, please give them a link to it. It'll help them and it'll help me too. I'd also like to invite you to help me find out more about the challenges you're facing, your dreams, your goals, and how I can help you overcome what's holding you back. We both do better when we know better, and your success is my success. So please reach out and interact. You can visit our website bestbusinesscoach.ca for Canada or California, where I'm from and where I'm living. You're welcome to also try out one of our paid programs. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, and pretty much every other social media channel you can think of. You should also subscribe to the podcast. And if you're enjoying them, please leave us a nice review. It really helps. That's all for now. Once again, thank you. Take care of yourself. And remember, the world needs the best business you can build. And I believe in you.